If you're good at investor relations, then you are creating content that is informative, educational, and supportive of your investor base. And you have a way of communicating that in a way that you're able to bring it down and make it accessible to investors at every level of the game. Do you love your job, but want other investment options than your company's 401k and trying to pick stocks? If so, you've come to the right place. In this podcast, you will get actionable information for your passive real estate investment journey. Welcome back to another episode of Work Hard, Invest Harder podcast. Here's your host, Justin Dixon. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the Work Hard, Invest Harder podcast. I'm your host, Justin Dixon. And today we've got Julie Holly on the podcast. She is the founder of Three Keys Investments. On this episode today, we talk a lot about her journey into real estate via starting out as a school teacher, then also was a real estate agent in the residential world before shifting to the dark side and going full into commercial real estate syndication. She is heavily focused on investor relations, raising money for deals in the assisted living space, as well as multifamily acquisitions and renovations, as well as ground up developments. We talk a lot in this episode about things to ask a sponsor or somebody that's bringing you a deal. If you are a passive investor, how to vet those sponsors to make sure that they are going to be the best steward for your invested money. Also, she is hosting her own Conscious Investor Growth Summit in Idaho, March 8th through the 10th. Anybody that listens to this episode and puts in the promo code invest harder, all caps, all one word, invest harder, will get a 50% off of that growth summit. So let's get Julie on the pod. All right, Julie, welcome to the podcast. Super excited to be here. Thanks for hosting. Yeah, no, I appreciate you joining. Obviously, you're an accomplished podcaster, which we'll talk about here in a minute. But I guess maybe start everybody off, give them a little bit of an overview of who you are, where you are, and then we'll unpack some stuff. Awesome. Thank you. So I'm Julie Holly. I am founder of Three Keys Investments, host of the Conscious Investor podcast. And I come from a real estate pedigree. So I'm third generation in real estate, but I'm the black sheep because I left the residential space, including my husband, who is a a partner in a brokerage. Um, So he's part owner and focuses on residential. And I'm like, there just has to be a better way to invest in real Mm -hmm. estate. So I went rogue. I'm the black sheep, which meant I had to learn a lot. That was very frustrating because similar to your story, I was actually in residential real estate sales in my early mid twenties and did really well at it. But I would sit in sales meetings and I'd be beside commercial brokers. Like, why did you not tell me? I mean, I know it was early 2000s, totally dating myself, but I'm just like, how, how and why did they not explain to every person there and it's okay. God has a perfect plan. I'm cool with it. I also have a background following my mom's path in education. So I couldn't decide. I love both my parents, <laughs> drank the Kool-Aid of both of their career paths, and God just braided everything together. So when I discovered apartment syndication, which is like I have a faith testimony and a real estate testimony, I literally was driving up to the gym at Odark 30 one morning and heard Monique Calm on Bigger Pockets. She's the okay. first woman I heard on the podcast after months of listening. And she spoke about house hacking. Wait, I did that in my early 20s. And she spoke about apartment syndication. And she completely transformed my life because of how she explained it. And I'm like, Oh, my gosh, I love real estate. I love educating people. I love serving people. And I love good business practices that my family had always taught me is everybody wins. And I'm like, syndication done well, right? Crowdfunding done well, private investments done right means the seller wins, the investor wins, the sponsor team wins, like the community wins, like it's an endless sea of everybody winning. And it makes my heart happy. Drink the Kool-Aid never went back. Very interesting. Well, we've got a lot to unpack. So I always like to hear kind of people's kind of evolution into real estate. And obviously, it sounds like you were indoctrinated into real estate early on, on the residential side. So let's go back to when you were a realtor. Were you also a teacher and a realtor at the same time? And a side note, my mother was also an educator. So have the affinity of the education side of the house as well over here. But yeah, were you doing both at the same time? So yes and no. I'm this weird person that I've allowed myself to really 
kind of pull a Madonna effect is what I call it. Madonna is iconic for being able to mm. reinvent herself over the decades, over her lifetime. And so I think I've allowed myself that same latitude to just continually grow, evolve, expand, and discover the possibilities. So I was a classroom teacher, but I started when I was 22. Like I graduated college early, jumped into the career, yep. decided actually I want to do this scary thing. The thing that really scares me is going into residential real estate sales, but it also excites me and I want to try that and I don't want to die not trying that. So right. I made that transition. So to your point, I was a teacher and then I had that overlap of transitioning into full-time real estate sales. Ironically, or I guess coincidentally, I went back into, I stayed at home with our kids when they were little, went back into education. And then I transitioned from full-time teaching into full-time real estate investing. So similar transition from education into full-time real estate once again. Got so it. I've gone through a lot of those job transitions and I do some performance coaching that helps people make that transition because it's definitely an interesting transition for people to make. Yeah, no, I think there's a few things to think about there. One is there's a massive mindset shift going from a W-2 job, whether it's a teacher or a software engineer or whatever, into something that is unknown. You have to learn everything. Real estate sales is commission only typically, right? So you've got to kind of shift your brain away from getting a steady eddy paycheck. I will say our realtor that sold us our first house in Philadelphia used to be a teacher and he was probably the most helpful, walked us through every step of the process way in advance. Like he literally taught us along the way of buying a house. So I feel like that combination of teacher and into something different, especially in something that's real estate where you have to teach people, whether it's buying a single family house or why should I invest in a syndication, which we'll get into, like you have to teach them and get them to kind of understand without selling to them, right? Because you can come off salesy in some instances. So I think I've had a good experience with a teacher turned real estate agent. And it sounds like that's been a good experience for you as well. As you kind of made that shift, like how did you and your husband and your family kind of think about that mindset shift of going from we have a paycheck coming in every month and we may not next month because I'm shifting into a new career, right? You said you work with entrepreneurs and try to make them understand how that works. Like, how did you guys kind of prepare yourselves for that? Well, my husband and I have also made this shift multiple times. So we had our first child in 2008. And at the exact same time, my husband was like, I want to go into residential real estate. And this is a complete divergent Got from it. everything he's done, right? We have different ways we tell a story because we both <laughs> see things differently on this. But he says, I laughed at him. I'm like, it was funny, right? Because like, of course you would. It's the son-in-law thing to do in my family. Like right. that makes sense. And so we had gone through that already. I had left my job as an educator to stay at home with our son. And now we're leaving his steady eddy paycheck, right? For him to go into residential real estate in the worst market ever. I was going to say, he had the bright idea to do it in 08. Uh, that's interesting. <laughs> Nobody Could've knew genius, how right? bad. It's probably genius because it was like, get in while everybody's getting out and then <laughs> ride the wave up. No one knew how bad it was going to be that residential. Like, nobody knew. And I'm raised in real estate. Like Even though it was residential, you still understand the ebb and flow of how real estate works. And yeah. it's like, that's still, I understand. And that was a bad recession. But all that to say, we've gone through that transition multiple times for us. And this is going to resonate different. So I'm going to answer this two ways. For us, faith is central in our life. And we just believe it allows us to live a life that doesn't look like it makes sense to a lot of people. And we'll take these ginormous, scary leaps. They'll look that way to other people. But if we both feel aligned, like this is where God wants us, we will go for it. And it has always worked out. It hasn't always been perfect, but is always worked out. And so I think at this point, having done that for a couple of decades, we feel very comfortable. Doesn't mean it's not scary. But I think that right there is really interesting is that the moment you step into the zone of being an entrepreneur, what you're really saying is you have to have a belief that is greater than you because you're going to doubt yourself. You're going to not know really clearly, completely what the next step is. And you have to simply trust the process and believe like all things will work out for me. All things guided me to this. So whether or not you share my same, you know, listener, whether or not you share my same belief system, 
we all have to have some type of belief that is anchoring us because as entrepreneurs, as people who leave that comfort and stability, and uh, let's just be real. Okay, let me finish my thought. But as we're leaving that, we have to have a greater belief. But really, what is the comfort and stability of that paycheck? And that's why I left education really full circle. The first time around was they were handing out pink slips. And that is really what gave me that last like, okay, just go for it. And that is because although I didn't get a pink slip, it's like, oh, I thought that this like really cushy, it's not cushy, it's hard work, but I love working with kids. So I'm like, I thought that this job was going to be steady and that I'd be able to just retire and have a great teacher's pension at the end of the day. And now I might not like, I didn't know that this could happen. So life is full of so many wild cards. I have a friend right now who works in the tech industry. He just turned 60 and he's seeing what is happening with the different companies. And he knows I'm specifically not naming any type of names of any companies, but he knows how things fall. And he has said, like, I'm an old timer. I better be investing in real estate really well, because if something happens to my division, I'm going to be one of the people, I'm going to be one of the first to go, even though I have more experience, knowledge, all of that. So yeah. we can't have that comfort and security in that paycheck at the same time. Yeah, no, I completely agree. And I've been in recruiting my entire career, 17 years, and I've worked in corporate America and startups. And unfortunately, when they have to make their budgets and their investor returns, yeah. when you're an employee, you are an expense, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. And you could be the best employee in the world and you may be the one that gets the pink slip or thanks, but no thanks. So I've seen it myself in the sense of I've hired a lot of people in my day. Unfortunately, some of those people have been laid off for no fault of their own. And unfortunately, that is what it is. And so, yes, I completely agree that when you take that entrepreneurial leap, you, whether it's faith or manifesting or whatever it is, like you also have to believe that you won't know all the answers. You won't know the outcome, but you know no. that if you do the work, you're yeah. going to get to where you're supposed to be. It may take longer. I started my business in January of 2020. Nobody was hiring in 2020. Thank you, COVID. But hindsight, it's been amazing. So this is not my podcast or, or about me. So I just wanted to share that a little <laughs> bit that yes, if you're a W2 worker investing in something that's going to generate passive income, that if you do have an oh crap moment, and you get laid off, you have something to kind of fall back on. I talk a lot about financial foundation, having that yeah. nest egg, having those assets that will support you in an event of something negative happening, whether it's medical bill or whatever the case is, at least you'll have that fallback. So I want to kind of transition into the syndication world because obviously you started in residential and then kind of made that switch to the dark side, so to speak. I want to kind of start that conversation right after we have a quick sponsor break. Whether you're in a job you love or hate, Building a financial foundation is important. This foundation can support you by providing passive income, stability in an uncertain economy, or the launching pad for you to start your own business. Great Venture Capital helps busy professionals invest in commercial real estate to build passive income streams, grow wealth, and take advantage of tax benefits. If you'd like to learn more, check us out at greatventurecapital.com or send an email to Justin at greatventurecapital.com. We are back on the Work Hard, Invest Harder podcast. We got Julie Holly on. And so we are kind of in the process of making the shift in your journey to kind of the commercial real estate side. So when would you start kind of that shift? Why? And then we can kind of unpack some stuff and talk about passive versus active and all of that. So as soon as I discovered, as I mentioned, I heard Monique Calm on Bigger Pockets describe syndication. And literally that day, I jump in. I'm not a complacent person. Like if you show me the way, I am going to be running down the path <laughs> down the road, right? And yep. so as soon as I heard her describe it, syndication, I literally found Michael Blanc's podcast. Back then, there weren't a ton of podcasts out there about apartment investing, about multifamily, about syndication. So I started devouring. I found them and I devoured them and I found the books. So I did what a lot of people do and that is go down the free path. Okay, what yep. is accessible and free that I can consume? And I used Michael Blanc's book as like a Bible basically. And I started like, okay, checklist. Like, did I do this? Check. Did I do that? Check. I got the LLC. I got this, right? And there was this turning moment in the story. And that is there was COVID had ended and events were coming back around. And so 
I'm like, oh my gosh, I need to go to DealMaker Live. Okay. I need to go to this event. And I had networked enough to where I knew there were like certain people I wanted to meet in person. And my husband, and I, a lot of people are going to relate to this. My husband was like, I just don't know that you're really going to like stick with this for the long haul. Like, I know you're an excitable person and I know you've been doing this consistently and stuff, but why don't you just hold out and wait? And I listened to that voice of reason. He knows me very, very well. And so I'm like, gosh, I know that I'm committed to this, but maybe there's an element of truth to this. And then that whole event took place and I saw partnerships form with the people that I wanted to go and connect up with. And FOMO was the most real thing ever. <laughs> it wasn't FOMO. Like I full on missed out. Okay. Got it. So, okay. The next time an event popped up, I found the next event that was a real estate guy's secrets of successful syndication seminar. And one of the ways I vetted this was I said, okay, I don't want to go to some cheap event because if it's cheap, then it's probably not worth it. Yeah. So I'm going to go to this one because it seems like it has a content that I need. I want to be an active investor. And so I need a certain type of education. If you're a passive investor, you might want to go to a different type of conference that really teaches you some different elements so that you can be a strong passive investor. And I wanted my husband to go as well. And I think that this is really important. Having your spouse aligned or your partner being aligned. I said, even if you don't want to do this with me, can you just learn with me so we can right. have conversations about it? And I'm not going to be speaking a completely different language. We go down to this event and it was super powerful and wonderful. Then we go, I know I'll speed this up. Then we go to a third event because I finally can meet the person I wanted to meet way back when. Yeah. And I'm like, where are you going to be guys? And they're going to like, okay, we're going to be at Rod Cleef's event. I'm like, tickets are $200. Like, <laughs> how good is this event? And it's in LA. I'm like, I grew up in California. I don't ever need to go back except, yeah. you know, occasionally. Right. So all that to say, I'm like, honey, let's just go down there. Let's just go to this event. It's not going to cost us too much money and we can meet these people. We go down there and that's where everything changed. Yeah. Like everything changed. I joined the mentorship program. Like it worked out well for me. There are a lot of mentorship programs out there. So I'm not saying like that's one for everybody. I'm just saying like joining a mentorship program, getting plugged in, everything just took this huge domino effect. But I'm going to back up a little bit and then I'm like going to breathe and let you like <laughs> jump in. But yeah, no, uh, one of the other important elements is that throughout this process, we were taking really critical steps as every former educator would probably do. I thought about what are the things that I want people to do when they invest with me? I know I want to be an active investor. I know I want to be investor relations. And that means people are going to be placing large amounts of capital into our private investments. Yep. So I really believed it was my responsibility to take an entire year. We invested passively. We rolled over our old 401ks. We learned and dove into infinite banking, which goes by lots of other names. Like, so basically everything that are not everything, but the major experiences that many passive investors engage are things that I'm like, I need to understand this first. I don't want to ask people to come and invest in my private investments. And I really don't even know the feelings. I really haven't experienced a process myself. Like, let me pave the path before them and then invite them along on my own experience. Yeah, I think a couple things I thought about. One, passive investing, if you want to be active is super powerful, because to your point, you need to know the steps of the process. So if you're asking somebody, hey, I'm investing in this deal, I'm raising money for this deal, whatever the case is, you know what to expect, because you're going to be sent if you're a passive investor or active investor, you're gonna be sent a PPM document, which is 150 pages of legalese. And how many people read that very few, but it's important to know the key areas of that PPM. Yes. So that you can go through it and say, okay, I think this makes sense. All the terms are aligned with what I was communicated, et cetera, et cetera. So that's how my wife and I got started. And the other thing is when you kind of get into this real estate world, you learn about things like you mentioned, rolling over an old 401k into a self-directed IRA, and you can actually use that money to invest passively in deals. 
You talk about infinite banking, that's a whole other podcast and whole other conversation about what that means and how to leverage that to not only generate passive income in your future, but also leverage it for investments and paying yourself and all that fun stuff. So that's definitely a longer conversation. But it sounds like you were kind of doing this education, going to these events in like 2020, 2021. Is that right? Just after COVID? So I discovered it in 2018. 2019 is when I missed out on events. And I left education in 2020. Got it. Okay. So our timelines, my wife and I started investing in 2019. 2020 was our kind of like my oh crap year because I quit my corporate job and started a recruiting business and focused on real estate. So that was, you know, but the silver lining, I think to your point is COVID and the shutdown meant I had a lot of time. And so I dove into real estate syndications, right? And Mm -hmm. there is a lot to learn and you have to form partnerships like you did at events, you have to find other people that are experts or more experienced or have more money, etc, etc. When you think about syndications and in your syndication journey with three keys, what job or what area of the syndication do you do? Are you finding deals? Are you only raising money and doing investor relations? Like where do you fall in that general partnership group that kind of sits on top of the deal that's being found? Investor relations. That is all I've ever wanted to do. (laughs) And that's so funny, because a lot of times investors will say, I don't know what I'd be good at. I don't know what role I should be. And I've always known. And the reason is because it is the education. If you're good at investor relations, then you are creating content that is informative, that's educational and supportive of your investor base. And you have a way of communicating that in a way that is not high level, that you're able to bring it down and make it accessible to investors at every level of the game. And so it's really important to just like put all of those elements together. So I love supporting the investors. I believe that if you're going to be good at investor relations, you need to have a heart that is actually mother henning, kind of hedging and protecting your limited partners. So There have been a couple of times I have very solid partnerships, like they're amazing people, but I am that one that brings up at the table when the GP members are meeting, I'll be like, and the passive investors who have no voting rights, this is what I hear them saying, right? And so we have to have somebody that's sitting at the table that is actually serving as that voice for the limited partners to advocate for them. And again, that doesn't say my partnerships, they're solid people and they're great people. But sometimes we just need to also really raise our level of awareness to say, this would be the best way for us to go about solving this situation. Or it could be, we could go all these different ways. Which way are we going to go? Okay, well, let's go back. Like our fiduciary obligation and responsibility is to our limited partners. So I think that's all super important for people to always keep in mind and to ensure that when you're placing an investment, do you have somebody that is literally dedicated to advocating for you at the table? There are a lot of people out there raising capital and like they're just doing it for let me get my acquisition fee and let me do it to get all these fees and get my split and my units. And I got this much GP ownership. Like who cares about all of that? Like, are you taking care of the people that you set out to care for? Yeah, I think you were investing in the same time frame that we started investing in 2021 and 22 when deals were flying off the shelves, people were spending a bunch of the money, interest rates were super low. And it was exciting, right? We got into a lot of deals. And now we're realizing that I'll ask this question first, I guess, what type of syndications are you doing? Are you doing the traditional BC class 100 plus unit value add in the Sunbelt variable rate debt bridge loan into a refi? Like, is that the model that your partners are doing? No, it's not. And a huge reason that it's not is because I was raised in real estate (laughs) and I did see a lot of things that you can't unsee. And so I've always had an aversion to variable interest rates. Like it freaks me out. Literally, I have a sleep at night policy that does not pass my sleep at night policy. I like that Um, policy. There are times where it is appropriate to have a bridge loan. And right now we have an assisted living facility that we acquired maybe four months ago at this point. And so in that case, we used Bridge to go into a HUD product Mm. because HUD takes a long period of time. I mean, it can take all the way up to a year for HUD to approve your loan. And so in order to work with the timelines, yes. However, there are 
in that case, we actually have like kind of some bumpers, some guardrails in place. So, I mean, that bridge alone has the multiple extensions on it. Like we just hedged in so many different ways. So it's like, yeah. okay. And our broker is confident in was simultaneously working on the HUD loan and underwriting the bridge to the HUD standards and everything. Right. So, I mean, we just went through so many measures to ensure that we were being safe utilizing that tool because it is a tool to be utilized. But yeah, it could be utilized for good or bad, right? If you don't know what you're doing and you just run in and get a variable rate debt without a rate cap or any kind of like financial cushion, yes. And we're seeing it in the multifamily market right now, oh right? Gosh. A lot of people are losing deals, recapitalizing deals, et cetera, et cetera. So it's um, scary. Yeah. For your part, it sounds like you've got a core group of a handful of people that you know, like, and trust that I'm assuming that they are the ones that are out finding the deals. Yes. You are brought in as, hey, we found this assisted living facility in some place. And you're brought in to say, hey, we need to raise this much equity and you come in and help with that. Is that kind of the model that you have? Yeah, that is very much the model. I have one of my other backgrounds is writing. And so that's where it really gets to shine. Oftentimes I am somebody that's writing investor relation updates and things like that, just to ensure. And again, most people will trivialize and be like, oh, that's cute. You're writing something. You go and try to write some of these investor relation (laughs) updates. Like you have to take these really complex terms. You have to understand and use discretion. How much do you say? Your partners need, your passive investors need to be informed. They need to know everything. But how much are you going to bring them in? Are you going to bring them onto every nitty gritty detail? And so there's actually a lot of thought that has to go into these. What some people say, like, oh, that's just silly. It's a silly update. But actually, there's a lot of thought that goes into the thinking behind it that's really important. It takes time, care, and attention. Yeah. I mean, those updates are silly when things are going super well and who cares your distributions are coming (laughs) in they are very important and very critical when deals are starting to slide and we've got to communicate positive distributions right and hey this is not going well and i think as an investor myself passively like i want to know the good the bad and the ugly because the last thing i want to know is hey we sold this deal and we lost all your money or you're only getting 10 percent of your capital back or whatever the case is right and knock on wood that hasn't happened to any of the deals that i'm in passively or actively but i know people that it's happened to right and they get the pink slip like we talked about earlier they get that like email of like, hey, we had to make this decision as a general partnership team. And because you're an LP, you don't get a voice in that room, right? And so I massively appreciate what you do, because it's important to communicate effectively to investors. I think some people do it really well. I think there's room for improvement kind of across the board. I think there's Uh, always room for improvement on it, quite frankly. I'm like, I always know that there's room for it, like I can improve. But to your point of keeping investors up to date, we're in the midst of a 184 ground up development class A multifamily in the Sunbelt. And we had a road closure that set our timeline back. And then with that delay in the road closure, then we ran into the interest rates. Mm. Now, that's just what happened. And we had somebody pass away. I, we've kind of had a lot of stuff happen on this deal. You have to communicate that. And right. you have to say in those updates to say, hey, city council still hasn't given us approval on the road closure. Like, we're still waiting for that. Okay, yeah. we're still waiting to hear for our pre-approval on the loan through HUD. Because everybody wants to know what's taking place. It's when you're silent and you're not saying anything. Now, at this point, just to be clear, like at this point, we've been in tandem doing site prep, getting permits. We've been moving and shaking things around as much as possible and actually improved and like increased the value of that land already like substantially. And so there's already appreciation at hand. So uh, it's just that you have this delay, (laughs) you know, and we can't change it, but we have to communicate it. Well, and you communicate what went wrong or what happened, but then what are we doing to mitigate, change, pivot, whatever the case is, right? Instead of just saying, hey, our interest rates went up, so our hands are tied. Like you have to at least communicate like, here are the things that we're looking at. Here are the things that we're trying to do to mitigate it. Because everybody can play money morning quarterback and say, well, you should have bought a rate cap or you shouldn't have done variable rate. Well, it's like, yeah, we shouldn't have, or we should have done something different, but we didn't. And here's where we are. And here's where we're moving forward. So what is kind of your area of focus? Because obviously, we've already talked about two separate asset classes, assisted living and grounded development multifamily. So what are the 
areas or if somebody's listening to this and like, hey, I'm interested in learning more, like what kind of mm -hmm. assets do you kind of focus on? Those are the two asset classes, multifamily and assisted living. I put them in this one bucket called housing for humans. And so there are a lot of really great asset classes that we can invest in and we can diversify in. And instead of having shiny object syndrome, because let's be real, they all have their times when they shine and every single one of them gets to be like the star of the show at different right. points. Multifamily sunsetting right now and self storage, I think is actually on its like, I think it's going to get taken over by light industrial on the like who's in the mm. limelight type thing, right? So somebody's always in the limelight as this yeah. is the it asset class type thing. But my heart has always been, I want to support humans. I want to provide a difference. Maslow's hierarchy of needs, like shelter is one of the primary needs. And if we can truly serve people on such a powerful level as to create a place that they love to call home, whether that be a, in an apartment complex or in an assisted living community. And either way, if they can love and call that home and say that with heartfelt passion, then we've done our job. Like we have served them and a community well, because I believe people show up much better in life when their basic needs are met. No, I completely agree. And are you only doing development deals for multifamily or are you doing acquisitions and kind of the, you know, a all of it? Okay. But let's just say all of it. I have not done class C. So we've done A, we've done B, we've done everything from the ground up development to fully stabilized to, to light value add. And, I have and been where are you doing them? That's another one. I'm market agnostic. This is beautiful. I mean, I have a really strong network. And one of the rules that we have is so far we've never, but it's like we don't partner with people we don't know. Like, have I known you for a year? Have we broken bread? Have we created content? Do we actually know how we're going to show up? And I think yeah. a lot of the blood in the streets is because people are like going to events, they're on the event high and they're like, oh my gosh, I like you, Justin, you're so cool. Like we just do a deal. I'm like that's super cool that you guys like each other, but how about you actually test that and then you start seeing, do they show up to the podcast on time? <laughs> Can we communicate well about things? Like actually getting to know people and seeing how they show up in different settings, even going to events. Like, I don't mean to sound creepy, but like you can just watch. Like, if you think you want to partner with somebody, just watch how they carry and conduct themselves at an event yeah. and say, like, do I want my brand associated? Like, is this going to be complimentary? Are we going to be mutually beneficial to each other's ecosystems? Because we're going to be partnered up. And do I want For that years. person as? For years, Three years, right? Once the acquisition is done, that's when the work starts, right? Like the next four or five years is you're attached at the hip, right? I want to talk a little bit about something I think is very poignant right now, given where we are We're recording this late January of 2024. Vetting a sponsor, vetting a general partner. If a passive investor is like, maybe they're an entrepreneur, maybe they are a software engineer, they have a really great job, they've got income, or they've got an old 401k with a couple hundred thousand, they want to roll over and start using that to invest. What are things that you would want somebody to ask you as they are vetting mm -hmm. you as, hey, you're bringing me this deal, I've consumed your content, I think you're interesting. But for me to write you a 50, 100, $200,000 check, what are the things that you want them to ask? And what are some things that you ask your kind of potential general partners? Because I think that's very important right now to know the deal is the deal, but you need to make sure that you know the person that's bringing that deal to you, right? So what are some things that you want people to ask you or you ask other people? I ask very different questions than a lot of people ask. And I'm going to answer this question in a, a little bit different way. And say, even when I have investor discovery calls, I know they're not normal investor discovery mm -hmm. calls. I know that there are a lot of times people be like, I've got 15 minutes. I'm going to go down this list. I'm going to make sure I've got you qualified. I'm going to make sure I know your income. And if you're accredited, da, 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 do I even like you? I might not want you in my private investment community. Yeah. If we don't get along, because Check mark number one is, do you even like talking to the person? <laughs> like, and are they going to answer your call? And are they easy to communicate with? Because mm -hmm. I know my investors will reach out to me. They can text me. I don't mind. Like, I want you to reach out to me. I want you to feel comfortable. And I want you to have that safety net. A lot of people aren't going to want to do that because like, nope, not this time of day. I mean, I don't have anybody right. 
texting me at inappropriate times or anything, but it's like, how is that communication level? And do you like the person? And I know that sounds really superficial, but again, you're in this for years. You're yeah. not in this for like, hey, we just had dinner. That's great. And so that's my first check mark is do we like each other? Do we get along? Can we communicate? Now I want to know what's your track record? And that's fine if you're new into the multifamily. So if you want to get involved with somebody who's new, okay, that's fine. But what's your track record? I yeah. want to know about a time where everything was hitting the fan and how did you show up? Like, did you cave? Did you collapse? Like, I want some examples yeah. of how did you navigate deals? How did you navigate when they didn't close that road and that delayed your project? How did you navigate when the interest rates were adjusting? How did you navigate when you lost your job? Like, maybe you're trying to vet somebody who's new and they're trying to make that transition. Like, just see how people show up in the hard times in life because that's the character. And I believe that it's character that is going to drive the best decisions. And so is this somebody that's actually going to show up as a selfish jerk? Or is this somebody that's going to actually advocate for me because their ethics and integrity are so entwined with who they are that they couldn't sleep at night if they didn't do the right thing? Right. And then I'm going to throw one more thing in there. And this is like a newer. And again, I know that these aren't the normal check the box like we could go through underwriting and say look for these five things because i have those everybody talks about that but I, a lot of people aren't talking about these elements and i'm starting to look around the linkedin used to, i can't believe this is the first time i've said this out loud linkedin used to be my favorite place i've been mostly off of linkedin for about four months now and it's because i'm discouraged i feel like it's not predatory in a sense of people are trying to take advantage but it's the same old, same old. And it's like, let me tell you my story and why you should invest with me and have passive real estate. Like, yes, you should. And yes, that's great. And get the brand message out there. I do understand that. At the same time, maybe you're too hungry. Maybe you're too hungry and you're posturing a lot and you're flexing a lot. Like, I don't know. There's something there. And I have a post on authenticity on LinkedIn from December, I think of 2023. There's something that's just not lining up right now for me with how a lot of people in multifamily are showing up or commercial real estate to the table that's making me feel hesitant. I've learned which intuition to trust. And I'm like, yeah. okay, there's a red flag there. And I would just be mindful as to who you are investing in. And like, if you see them and they're flooding the gates too much, maybe there's something going on. But I yeah. admit... I used to flood the gates a lot also. So I'm like, not saying that people are bad. I'm just saying be a wide eyed. <laughs> yeah. I mean, at the end of the day, everybody looks great on Instagram or LinkedIn or whatever. Right? Um, one thing that I've shifted away from just for podcast guests, I don't reach out to people on LinkedIn anymore because everybody looks like a genius and they're super successful. And a lot of them are. But if I do, I ask them about how are their deals performing right now? Because yeah. I don't like, and this is maybe me, as a person, I don't like this, but I don't like when I see people raising money when I know that they have deals that are not going well or are in a bad position. And I just feel icky when I see them touting new deals. And I'm like, well, you should have been being a fiduciary and doing everything you can. And maybe they are, and I don't know, right? But for me, I just am like, I would never raise money on a deal for deals or be as all over social media about it if I had something that was going ultra poorly. So that's just okay. my two second rant. I have for, to say right thank then. you. No, I have to say thank you. That right there. That's why I have the feelings I have. You just like, you brought my awareness level sky high. Exactly. Because you and I know the behind the scenes of different operators, I'm sure. And I am like, oh, what are you doing? And why are you running another deal? Like to your point, like why? And so that's made me have that icky feeling and like, I just feel like I want to stay over here and almost because I want to disassociate with what's happening specifically on LinkedIn is like, yeah. I kind of want to disassociate with what's going on at this period of history, because I don't want people to be like, oh, she's part of this group because she invests in, they're good people. I'm not saying that anybody's bad or they have bad intentions. It's just that I'm so particular about deals and yeah. so particular about partnerships and while our ground up development has had setbacks. We're still moving forward and our other deals are strong. So I'm like, but I grew slowly 
And I said, no, and I didn't get greedy. And I didn't say I had plenty of opportunity. And I just was very judicious over the yeses. It's like, I'd rather do great deals and good deals. I'd rather do two, three great deals than five, six good deals. And guess what? If you have five, six really like good deals, that's still a lot of work on your plate. And that takes a lot of time, care, and attention. And if you're doing that year after year, that adds up. So after three years, if you have six deals, now you've got 18 deals. If you're an active investor, I'm just saying, like, I know I don't like dropping plates and I could be very prone to it if I have too much. And if it's other people's money on the line, I need to be aware as an active investor to say, what is my own personal bandwidth? Again, owning this for myself, what's my personal bandwidth so that I can ensure that I'm taking care of what I already committed to in all of the millions that investors have put into these deals. Yeah. Yeah. I think if people are listening to this all the way through, I think the theme of this is like, be (laughs) cautious, ask a lot of questions. Don't just trust, trust, but verify, right? I think that's the age old saying. And I think that stands true. You have your own podcast. I don't limit people from touting their own podcast. I think we're all in this game together. So you've been doing it longer. You've got over 400 episodes. I'm coming up on my one year in a few months. So a lot less than 400, obviously. What do you share on that podcast? Like how do people show up and like what type of guests you have? Just so if people want to listen to a second podcast, because obviously they'll just continue to listen to this one, I'm sure. But what is your podcast all about? <laughs> I appreciate that. The Conscious Investor, if you've heard anything from me, it's a super high level of awareness and how I go about things. The show is very similar to that. Its focus is health, meaning physical, relational, spiritual, mindset, because we're guardians and gatekeepers of our mind. So Mindset Monday episodes, and then wealth building. And that wealth building is where I have real estate investors come on, very similar to you. I have learned, especially as I'm at 450 whatever episodes at this point now, which is crazy. We have a responsibility as content creators who are amplifying voices. And so I'm very mindful as to who is coming on the show and do I know, like, trust them and how they're going to instruct, encourage, or inform the conscious investor listener. So really cool. I love all the guests. I think they're really superstars recently recorded with Pace Morby, which was a lot of fun. And that episode is actually extremely heartfelt and mindful. It was a very different episode. I'm excited. Mm -hmm. So I'm at a point where I can have a lot of recognizable names on the show, but the focus is really how do we serve? One more element is each month I'm bringing on a guest to speak specifically to physical health and just once a month, but it's easy for us to talk about mindset. It's easier for us to talk about real estate investing, but I noticed I wasn't really nurturing that physical wealth part of the show. And so 2024, yeah, you can have all the money in the world, but if you're not physically healthy or mentally healthy to deal with it, what's the point? I'm a firm believer of move your body and eat right and invest right as much as you possibly can. And it's a whole circle, right? You got to kind of take care of yourself in all those areas. Last kind of thing before we kind of transition to the end here, we are recording this in early 24. What are your thoughts? I don't want to say predictions or. Oh, I did a whole episode on predictions. We can do it. Let's do this. (laughs) Yeah. Well, what's 2024 for you? Are you guys still in acquisition mode or what does that kind of look like? Yeah, definitely. I'm going to be reviewing another offering with some current partners. So continuing to acquire assisted living communities and multifamily, I firmly believe that we invest in every market cycle because the investment principles do not change. Does this deal make sense? Yeah. And interest rates are just one of many factors that can make or break a deal. And so it's like, okay, what are the bones on this? And can we generate the returns? And are we confident that we can generate those returns? That's all that matters. And how are we buying these deals? So I'd really like to see more assisted living facilities in our portfolio this year. The reason, and it's very heartfelt, is that there's an interesting dynamic taking place right now. And that is that a lot of the owners of assisted living facilities, they're actually at retirement age. Mm. And so almost 50% of assisted living facilities, I'm not talking about residential, I'm talking about 20 beds or more, they're tired, they're mom, 50% of them, they need to retire, they need to go enjoy life. And so 
there's a really unique opportunity right now to, again, create that whole win-win-win situation so that we can buy right, we can serve the owners by buying from them. That means also that we can serve those residents by continuing the highest level of care or more than likely improving the level of care that they're receiving. Yeah, I think 2021, 2022, kind of, as you're kind of coming out of it, it kind of gives you a little bit of shock, especially if you're just getting into real estate. And you're like, holy crap, is this what it is always like? Like, I thought this was supposed to be like, cash flow plus appreciation, like it's supposed to be the best of both worlds. So you can get a little gun shy. But one thing my wife and I also we always talk about is like, we were too scared to invest or too young to invest really when in 08, like I was just starting my career, she was still in college, like, we didn't like, know enough to start investing in anything at that point, what let alone real mm-hmm. estate. And then so we missed that kind of transitional generational wealth transition, we missed COVID. And now we're like, okay, well, this is another time where wealth is going to be transferred from unfortunate syndicators that overstretched or overbought whatever the case is. And some of these big institutions are going to come in and scoop these things up for pennies on the dollar hold them for a few years, and then sell them and make bunches of money. So to your point, I think 2024 is going to be probably slower from a transaction volume standpoint than 2022 or one for sure. But if you can make a deal work, if the deal still pencils, if you can still make it work and have the returns that you're projecting, in theory, the deal should be a slam dunk because potentially interest rates are going to be not increasing, maybe dropping. So I think if you can make a deal work in 24, I think it could be a really good buying opportunity. But we definitely don't want to miss this next transition of wealth that's likely going to happen over the next probably 12 to 18 months. Okay, I'm going to harp on it just ever so slightly and Mm -hmm. say, I think that's one of the talking points that's out there. It's like, I live in a place where it snows, you know, like, oh, the squirrels, there are more nuts on the trees this year. So this must be a hard winter, it must be that. And with the transition of wealth, I've heard it over the years so many times, like, oh, this is going to be it. This is going to be it. This is going to be it. And this is why just simply being disciplined investors and being consistent and disciplined, regardless of the ebb and flow or what's easy to say, being consistent and being disciplined is always going to pay out. I totally agree. I totally agree. I want to transition to the end. I've got a three pack of questions that I ask every guest. So I want a six pack. No, I only only (laughs) do three. I feel like, uh, you know, six is too long. Three is perfect. I feel (laughs) like. So the first question is, what's one piece of advice that got you started or helped you along your real estate investing journey? My mentor really drilled into me to know the numbers and to never settle and Mm. to never get into a deal that was marginal. And I think that's something that is forever imprinted on me and it should be good investors should always never settle. Yeah, we all use Excel documents so you can move things around and make the numbers look amazing. But once you start doing that and getting a little greedy, that's a recipe for disaster, unfortunately. So big time. Question two, what is your favorite real estate or business book that you're into right now? Oh, golly, real estate or business book. You know, I am actually devouring and I'm like, it's probably, yeah, it is right here. I've been devouring Donald Miller's book, Business Mm. Made Simple. I really like it because I do have a background in education. And so I don't have an MBA. And so <laughs> there is an element where there's an obligation on my part to continually improve my business practices and my understanding. And so this was something that I dedicated my year to as not just something I've always been working on, but I actually decided I'm like, I like Donald Miller. I like all of his work, by the way, I'm going to also shout out second book of his hero on a mission. Mm. Everyone should read this book because it really helps you find your vision, but the deeper sentiments behind it. But yeah, so this year, I actually even bought the course to go along with the business made simple book. I've never done that before. But I just, again, going back to the fiduciary that we have is continual improvement incrementally is powerful. And just choosing an area to focus on every year is really critical. Yeah, no, I agree. I've read his book, Marketing Made Simple. That was kind of one of the first ones that I, oh, that I read right. by, by Donald Miller. So that's, a, that's, that's great. A good story book. Brand, another great yep. one. I love Story Brand. I'm like, totally. All right. Final question. If you hit your financial freedom number, meaning you can live an amazing life just off of the passive income from your investments, what would you do? 
same thing I'm doing now. <laughs> there wouldn't be a change. I'm on a mission with the conscious investor to raise awareness for people to have personal freedom more than financial freedom. So most people are chasing after financial freedom and they're bankrupting the better parts of their life. Mm. And so when we have personal freedom, we are looking at all the elements of our life. We're looking at our relationships. We're looking at our creativity. We're looking at our spirituality. We're looking at everything in our life. And so financial freedom is one of those elements, but we can be so hyper-focused on financial freedom that we miss out on all of the other areas where we want to be free. And so instead of focusing on and isolating on to financial freedom, I and the conscious investor is focused on personal freedom. And I want everyone around the globe, like it's a crazy grand goal, but I want everyone around the goal to experience personal freedom. And one of my friends gave me pushback <laughs> and said, <laughs> what about the people in countries where, and he was talking about hardships and everything. And I said, I don't have to personally know what personal freedom looks like around the globe in every spot because people will rise up and be the champion and the pioneer of supporting people in their cultures around the globe in discovering personal freedom. And I can't speak to every culture around the world, but other people I hope will end up doing that. Yeah, freedom means different things to different people, right? And sometimes it's a financial number. Sometimes it's I just want to move someplace different. It's got its own flavor, depending on where you are and your circumstances. So Julie, this has been an awesome podcast. If people want to learn more about you, reach out to you, get in touch with you. It sounds like you've shunned off LinkedIn, uh, <laughs> maybe, but what are some ways that people can connect with you if they want to learn more? Head over to Three Keys Investments, all spelled out and plural, Three Keys Investments. Dot com. And you'll have access to everything to the podcast. If you're interested in learning more about our private investor community. Yeah, we do vet all of our investors. And there have been a couple of people that I've given different homes to, but usually people are a good fit because if you listen this far, I promise you, <laughs> you already know if you align with our philosophy or not. <laughs> Yeah, no, that makes a ton of sense. We will have all that stuff in the show notes, obviously. But Julie, this has been awesome. I appreciate you being on the podcast. Yeah, thank you so much, Justin. It's been a great time. I hope you got value out of this episode of the Work Hard, Invest Harder podcast. Your one-stop shop for education on how you can continue to work hard in your career and have different options to invest even harder. If you took anything away from this episode, please like and comment. I read every comment as it helps me serve you better. Make sure to subscribe and hit the notification bell. That way you won't miss out on more valuable content. If you're watching this video, it means that you wanna grow your passive real estate portfolio. The easiest way to do that is to join our investor club by heading to greatventurecapital.com slash invest. The link is in the show notes. See you on the next episode.